Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. PYA is pleased to offer this alternative way to access our thought leadership. This is a recording of a previously delivered webinar. The information is accurate as of the date of the original event. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website at pyapc.com. This podcast is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to be used as legal advice or an official opinion. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of PYA's Healthcare Regulatory Roundup webinar series. Today's topic is No Surprises Act Update. PYA is happy to present today's webinar on this important topic. With that, I would like to introduce our presenters, Marty Ross and Kathy Reap. Thank you, Trevor. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, you probably registered for a webinar called No Surprises Act, New Proposed Rules. And you just noticed Trevor referred to this webinar now as No Surprises Act Update. And here's why. Um, back in August, um, posted to the Office of Management and Budgets website, listing regulatory actions under review, there were two proposed rules relating to the No Surprises Act. One referred to the federal independent dispute resolution process fees. The second was IDR operations. And we anticipated that both rules would have been released by the end of October. What in fact has happened is that one of those two rules, the one concerning um, the administrative fee and the CIDR fee, has been published, and in fact, the comment period on that proposed rule closes tomorrow. And we will go into that proposed rule in depth today. The second of the rules that had been sitting at OMB under regulatory review, the one on IDR operations, um, yesterday uh, moved off the list. So every, you know, Kathy and I are the neurotic people that check the OMB regulatory update on how often, Kathy? Two, three times a day, probably? Absolutely. And I get an all caps email message from Kathy yesterday. Um, operations is off at OMB. And so we anticipated that the rule would be released yesterday or this morning. Uh, there are always three but bites of the apple. We felt it enough to release it this morning at about nine o'clock, but. No. But each day there's three bites of the apple. The public inspection for federal register is updated at 8.45, 11.15, and 4.15 Eastern each day. And that gave us four bites to see if this rule is going to be published. It has not been published yet. That means one of two things. It's going to show up this afternoon at 4.15, or some point later this week, or for whatever reason, um, the departments have pulled the rule. They have decided to go a different direction. And as we talk about today, primarily the impact of the Texas Medical Association decisions on the federal IDR process, that may be in fact because of those decisions and moving forward with appeals of those decisions, um, the departments determined that it would not be appropriate this time to release the proposed rule. We don't that, know the answer to that. Option, the other option that, that could have caused them to pull it, in addition to the TMA decisions, is literally the fact that Congress is now stepping in. Well, some, <laughs> we won't okay. go into a discussion of what's going on in the House. But. That that we won't go there, but there are letters being sent and just being asked what's going on here. And um, the other thing that Marty, you know, I'm going to be totally off subject now, but uh, even today we had news of um, a major um, provider filing bankruptcy. This happened to be an air ambulance provider. One of the reasons they gave for that was um, No Surprises Act. We've had it with a, a group of uh, representing um, hospital-based physicians. So we wind up are they getting to Congress as well and getting their concerns out there and Congress getting more involved in terms of what's been going on since we passed this law? Right. Because, I mean, th this summer we've discussed at length the price transparency legislation that has been winding its way through Congress. It would not be surprising to see 
changes to the No Surprises Act um, being incorporated into that legislation as well. So that's why we have a, a proposed rule that we will discuss, which is the um, administrative fee and the cider fee rule. Um, but we thought this was an excellent opportunity um, to walk through the No Surprises Act, particularly um, the surprise billing component of the, the, the legislation and the regulatory scheme, as it now stands following um, extensive litigation, primarily led by the Texas Medical Association. We have four decisions um, from the federal court in Texas uh, directly impacting the No Surprises Act. So we very cleverly refer to these decisions as TMA 1, 2, 3, 4. Um, and in response to each of those decisions, um, the departments have taken action. And so we're going to try and provide you with as accurate a possible where we are today um, with uh, the impact of that legislation on the process itself. Um, if, in fact, this other proposed rule, um, the one concerning operations of the IDR, is published this week, we will, of course, prepare a summary for that and send that out to attendees because we don't want you to be shortchanged um, by content for this webinar. So with that, let's start at the beginning, um, have Kathy do a brief reminder of the basics of the New Surprises Act. So over to you, Mrs. Reap. Yes. So what are we talking about here? Um, if you will take back, go back a little bit into the No Surprises Act, we're going back a couple of years, but essentially what we are looking at is a, um, a congressional action that really focused on the issue of surprise billing. So many complaints from patients saying, I did not know that I was going to get a bill, um, concerns about um, a um, perhaps a physician being out of network. I didn't know I was going to have that additional doctor. I didn't know that he was out of network and now I have to pay his full bill, things like that. A lot of dialogue, a lot of discussion, and therefore the legislation came in that really was intended um, to put a stop to surprise billing. And as I said, because of some of the financial implications on um, certain provider types, um, we are seeing that perhaps it is, to some degree, doing what it was intended to do, whether right or wrong. But essentially, under the um, legislation, um, we had two, two real components to it. First of all, under the surprise billing, which is what we're going to focus on today, um, out-of-network facilities and providers are not allowed to charge patients more then they're in network cost sharing amount for emergency services. So it was very clear in terms of even going through a good definition that actually I think helped a lot of providers, hospitals in particular, in defining emergency services to include the point of um, stabilization and who would determine stabilization and like that. But patients, if they went out of network for an emergency service, they could not be charged more than their in-network cost sharing. Um, the, the rule also addresses out-of-network uh, providers who furnish non-emergency services at in-network facilities. So on that first bullet, we said facilities and providers out-of-network. But second bullet says providers. So if you are an in-network facility and you have physicians who are out-of-network, and the patient comes in for a non-emergent service. They too are limited to only charging the patient um, the in-network cost-sharing amount. Um, the process for defining um, cost-sharing um, was outlined in the rule. Um, and the, the big issue and what we're going to really focus on today is the establishment of a um, federal independent dispute resolution um, process to determine the out-of-network payment rate when there is not a state mandated, this is how we do it. So we've had a lot of discussion back and forth and argument over how we calculate that um, out-of-network rate. Um, and so this is what, you know, the focus in terms of the, the back and forth that we've had so much of over the last year and a half. Finally, the other part of the, um, the law itself addressed good faith estimates 
And as a reminder, it does require um, um, facilities and providers, that should be providers, not procedures, but providers to furnish notices um, and good faith estimates to self-pay patients in spe uh, specified circumstances. You need to have your signage up there related to the ability to get a good faith estimate. You need to make sure that you are telling your patients that good faith estimates are available and actually providing those good faith estimates to patients upon scheduling. Marty? So one of the challenges with the No Surprises Act is it was not the first law um, to address these issues. In fact, at the time the legislation was passed in December of 2020, 33 states already had some version of surprise billing protections uh, applicable to state regulated plans. And the NSA did not purport to displace any of those state processes. In fact, it was intended as a gap filler uh, to address those circumstances where state law was unable to resolve these types of disputes. Um, so the premise of the NSA is if there is a state process that is applicable, use that state process to determine the patient's in-network cost sharing amount and or determine the out-of-network rate to be paid to the provider. Um, but that is a multi-step analysis because first of all, you have to determine does the state law apply to the plan at issue because states can only regulate fully funded plans. Um, Self-funded plans are regulated under the federal ERISA statute and regulations, which displace state law regulation of fully uh, self-funded plans. So that's the first question. Does the state law apply to the plan? Then the question is, does the state law apply to the facility or the provider? Or is the facility or provider an issue licensed by the state? And then finally, the question of, is the state law applicable to the service? Um, because many of the state laws only apply to emergency services. And as Kathy just reminded you, the NSA applies to non-emergency services furnished by a provider in an in-network facility. So that is part of our challenge with the NSA. And part of the reason we've seen a backlog in the federal IDR process is because these eligibility determinations have to be made up front. And part of the eligibility for the federal IDR process is that there is no state process in place to determine what the out of network rate would be. Um, and these are very challenging circumstances. And it also raises the question of, do you as the provider, can you in good faith determine that in fact the state law process applies? Uh, so how do you hedge your bets? Um, that if you do have a dispute with a payer on an out of network charge, should you initiate the open negotiation period within uh, that 30 days of receiving the initial notice of, of denial or payment from the provider? Because you need that open negotiation period to preserve your rights under the federal IDR process. Um, so I think that's what we're advising providers generally, is that if you do have a dispute, there is question of whether the state law process applies to that particular circumstance, run a track concurrent. Um, to preserve your rights in both circumstances. Um, well, Marty, Marty, were we ever able to establish the where the insurance is, where the provider is, where the patient is, and get an answer to that question? I think we have an answer that it's that if uh, and there's a, a FAQ that that was published by the departments, which does address this question of the facility and provider, and they rely on licensure. So the reference is um, in, the, in their FKQ table, and they're determining whether state or federal law applies. Their question is, is the facility or provider um, that is bringing the claim um, or has provided the service, are they licensed in the state whose state process you're looking to, to resolve the matter? I don't know the issue on the plan. Um, because as you know, a lot of plans will cross states. Uh, right. yeah, if I'm on, PYA has offices in seven different states. Um, it's a and so is this that plan uh, applicable to a process that's available in Missouri, for example? Uh, but I don't think we have a clear answer to that. Thank you. So, yeah, that again, that's one of the reasons we advise folks generally to go concurrent 
um, if there's a process that applies. Where you know that, so another piece of this is, again, states can only regulate state-regulated plans, uh, i.e. fully insured plans. So the federal process is going to apply uh, if it is a self-funded plan at issue, i.e. the employer is actually bearing the risk and using a third-party administrator for the claims. Except um, in there are states, uh, Georgia, Maine, Nevada, New Jersey, Virginia, and Washington, to be specific, where they have a process that allows self-funded plans to opt in. Um, so in those cases, if the, if the plan at issue has elected to opt into the state process, you would follow the state process as opposed to the federal process. Um, otherwise, um, state law is going to apply, um, again, and you see the list there, uh, when you have a fully funded plan. Uh, and so this has been one of those very challenging areas to navigate um, in the rules, uh, in practical application, and hopefully we'll, yes, we have some guidance from CMA, from the departments on this, uh, but certainly we could be more clarity around this. We also have a lot of state legislatures uh, who are reconsidering their Surprise Billing Act um, and determining whether it's appropriate to square up uh, with with federal law. No one's actually done it yet, but I know that certainly has been into consideration in some of these state legislatures that you see listed here. Kathy, back to you. This is back and forth time. Um, I just wanted to make sure that um, as we talk about background on this issue a little bit, that you are aware that there are a number of resources that are available to you um, that really get into the basics of um, the No Surprises Act. We have listed here a number of A, written documents, B, webinars that are available for you on demand, and finally, a um, good faith estimate workflow that was developed um, within PYA. And that good faith estimate workflow, in case you haven't looked at it lately, has actually been updated to include um, the fact that the co the requirement for a um, the good faith estimate to include co-provider information, that was delayed indefinitely. So that has been updated on this workflow in case you need to print off a new copy. For those of you who have stuck with us through all of these webinars, um, we want to thank you. Counseling is available. Um, but... <laughs> But if you have, if you do need to catch up, do a reminder, need something for your docs, they are all out there, um, that complying with the No Surprises Act to guide physician, for physician practices, um, still out there. Um, nothing has really changed from those requirements. So I wanted to make sure that you were aware that they were out there. So for the next 40 minutes, oh, we're going to... I feel like on the next slide I should go into song, but I won't. Oh, thank you, Kathy. Um, but we're going to spend the next 40 minutes talking about what has been impacted, what has been changing over the last year and a half to 20 months or so, which is the federal IDR process. Um, and we thought back and forth about how to introduce this and decided a timeline probably best explains um, how these processes have been evolving. So we start back in December of 2020. Uh, when the No Surprises Act was signed into law. It was part of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. And what concerned all of us at that point in time was the effective date. Um, the Congress said that the departments will be responsible for standing up these processes by January 1st of 2022, effectively one year from start to finish. Um, and I think now we are paying the price for the rush uh, to stand up this process. Um, so we waited. So we knew the law was there, we read the statute, but we had to wait for implementing regulations and wait for implementing regulations. And we saw the first interim final rule published in mid-July of 2021. So now we're five, less than five months out uh, from the implementation date. That interim final rule addressed surprise billing and focused in on the qualifying payment amount. Um, then about a, two months later, the departments published a proposed rule, uh, which was intended to address enforcement of the No Surprises Act. That rule has never been finalized. Um, it is still outstanding. Uh, there is commentary in the FAQs that the departments are still looking to publish that, uh, that in final form. 
this is part of the reason you're not seeing a lot of separate enforcement activity around the NSA, uh, because we don't have the civil money penalties or the corrective action plan, all that typical enforcement regulation um, provisions, those aren't in place yet because that proposed rule has been finalized. Um, then about a month later, uh, so now we're in about two months, three months, two months from implementation date, we get the second interim final rule. Uh, this one addresses the independent dispute resolution process, as well as the good faith estimate requirements. As I said, the effective date of the new law was January 1st of 2022. That's why we use the interim final rule process as opposed to the typical proposed rule process that the agencies use to roll out new regulations. And where you can ask, ask questions and get answers. Exactly. So an interim final rule, if you're not familiar with it, is yes, we're going to make it final, but we're going to afford stakeholders an opportunity to comment, and we'll take those comments into consideration to make any subsequent changes to the regulation itself. It's allowed under the uh, uh, Administrative Procedures Act. It's certainly not the preferred way of rolling out regulations, but really the departments had no choice because of the short timeline for implementation. But, but we've never seen a response to any of those interim finals. Exactly. Well, part of that is because this all this legislation, but these regulations got mired in litigation very quickly. Exactly. Um, so we had uh, in 2021, the Texas Medical Association was the lead plaintiff in the first of the lawsuits, uh, focused particularly on the, the qualifying payment amount for buttable presumption in the IDR process. So in that interim final rule in October of 21, uh, the department said IDRs should determine the out-of-network payment rate by selecting the offer between the provider and the payer that is closest to the applicable qualifying payment amount. And so that was immediately challenged. And in fact, the court in Texas ruled that that rebuttable presumption was directly contrary to the statutory language. Um, and so that sort of froze things up. Um, to, to figure out how that was going to move forward. Um, despite that confusion, uh, or that, I guess, um, lack of stability in the system, um, the federal IDR process actually opened on April 15th of 2022. And we began seeing uh, through the processes of these determinations relating to out-of-network rates. Um, then in August of 2022, the departments published a final rule um, that replaced the QPA rebuttable presumption in the IDR process. So again, remember we had the interim final rule back in October of 2021. It's replaced, in effect, or portions of it are replaced by that final rule that shows up in late August of 2022 intended to address um, the decision in TMA1. Um, then we have uh, some good news uh, in late December of 2022, um, no, sorry, early December of 2022, the departments announced that they were going to indef delay indefinitely the co-provider requirements under the good faith estimates. They had first announced that they would delay it for 2022, but insisted that it would be in effect for 2023. And then at the beginning of December, they say, yeah, no, 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 we're just going to indefinitely delay it. We understand that there are certain communication issues back and forth between co-providers and we can't address that. So that's the good news. And that's really the reason the GFE requirements have remained stable um, throughout this period. Um, an early Christmas present uh, from the departments in, in December of 2022, on the 23rd, they announced that they would be increasing the IDR administrative fee from $50 to $350 uh, for 2023. And this is the amount paid by parties to an IDR um, entity resolution uh, that covered just the administrative costs. So this is not a non-refundable fee you pay at the beginning of the IDR process uh, to simply maintain the IDR process. And, um, the agency, and the both by the provider and by the payer. Exactly. So this is the department's coming back and saying we had no expect. We were completely floored by the utilization of the IDR process. It's much more expensive than we thought we had ever thought it was going to be. So we're going to have to increase, you know, the IDR administrative fee seven times over. Um, so certainly that caught a lot of people off guard because now to challenge effectively any claim um, 
and the payment offered by the payer, uh, it may in many cases cost more than the amount of the claim to do that because you're from the beginning paying $350 is non-refundable um, to just get to the IDR process. And that was when we were also addressing what is a claim. Is it per CPT code or not? Right, exactly. Um, so that gets us to February of 2023 for the TMA 2 decision because um, the Texas Medical Association challenged the August 2022 final rule uh, because it created a, um, a different process for determining what the out-of-network rate would be, but it still deferred to the QPA. Um, it still said that in August of 2022, the department said, well, IDR entities, you should first look at the QPA, then consider other, other factors, and then tell us why those other factors counseled in favor of a rate other than the QPA. And again, the court said, yeah, no, that's not good enough. That's contrary to the legislation, the legislative language. Um, and so the, the court vacated that final rule. So where it stands today, and we'll go into a little more detail on this, is that the IDRs are left with the statutory language and determining uh, through consideration of the factors listed in the statute what the appropriate out-of-network rate should be. Then we fast forward to August of 2023, um, and we get the TMA-4 decision. Yes, I know we're going out of order, uh, but these are ordered by when the lawsuits were filed. Uh, TMA-4 was a challenge to the increase in the administrative fee, as well as the regulatory standard for batching claims. We'll go into more detail on that as well. A couple weeks later, we get the TMA-4 decision, um, which was three. a challenge. Yeah, three. I said it wrong. Thank you. Okay, we go from four to three. See why I got confused. But uh, three decision vacated um, the the provisions in the regulations concerning the calculation of the qualifying payment amount. So these were in the July 2021 interim final rule. Um, now we are challenging how the agencies interpreted the rules for calculating the qualifying payment amount. Remember the QPA is calculated by the plan. And so this is a challenge to the directives given to the plans in calculating the QPA again on the basis that what the regulation said was again not consistent with the statute. Um, that gets us to the um, September 26th proposed rule um, concerning the IDR administrative fee as well as the range of fees that could be charged by a certified independent dispute resolution entity or what we're now going to say re refer to as the sliders. Um, and so we have that proposed rule, as I mentioned previously, the comment period for that rule closes. And then finally, as we know, we still have that outstanding IDR operations proposed rule. So a lot's happened um, in a relatively short period of time. So let's start talking through where the IDR process stands uh, following the litigation and the, agents, the department's response to the litigation. And we're going to do this in the order of how a, resol how a matter goes through resolution. So not by in the order of the decisions, but instead the order of the process within the federal IDR process. So that starts with the QPA calculation. Um, and again, the, the plan is responsible for providing the QPA to the provider at the time that it adjudicates the claim. Because the provider has to have the QPA information to determine the appropriate amount to charge the patient. Because remember the rule is you can't charge the patient more than the in-network cost sharing amount. Well, if the provider's out of network, how do you know what the in-network cost sharing amount is? And that is the purpose of the QPA. Um, in the statute, the QPA is defined as the plan's uh, median rate for the same service in 2019. Um, in the same geographic area. And you, you find that median rate, and that's what we're going to assume is the out-of-network rate, uh, excuse me, the in-network cost share percentage will be based on that amount. 
what the court found in, Q, in TMA 3 uh, was that, uh, and I love the language the, the, the judge used here, um, that the departments cannot ignore the plain requirements of the act merely because insurers may be inconvenienced. Um, and they specifically addressed four matters relating to the calculation of the QPA. The first is including ghost rates. So remember, if it's the median rate charged by the plan, the plan has an incentive to maximize the number of rates included. Um, that includes ghost rates. And a ghost rate is, it's included in the contract with a particular provider, but that provider never furnishes that service. So it's like including anesthesia rates in a primary care contract, uh, because it's very unlikely that a primary care provider um, is going to administer um, anesthesia, um, other than maybe a local and doing a very small in-office procedure. Because that provider never furnishes the service, the provider has no incentive to negotiate the rate, and thus the plan has the opportunity to insert very low rates into those particular contracts. Um, and thus that skews the QPA lower, meaning a lesser amount available for the provider to collect from the patient. Uh, because you are basing the patient's code, the patient's um, in-network rate um, based on a lower overall QPA. Um, also, the court found issue with the inclusion of rates for physicians not in the same or similar specialty, um, closely related to the ghost rate issue. Um, they had the court overturned the exclusion of contingent payments. So you may have a fee schedule rate. Uh, for a particular service, but that provider has an opportunity through either a risk sharing arrangement or incentive based bonuses to increase that fee schedule payment. Um, the court said that should be included um, when calculating, QPA, calculating the QPA. And finally, and probably the most impactful, uh, the court uh, rejected the regulation that allowed the inclusion of rates from other plans that share the same third-party administrator. So you may have employer A has a self-funded plan um, and they have their plan rates, but they share a TPA with employer B. And what the plans were doing was including in the QPA the rates negotiated for the plan sponsored by both employer A and employer B simply because they sh shared the same TPA who had negotiated the agreements. So all of this, of course, throws up um, into the air all the calculations of QPAs um, and how these should be appropriately handled by insurers to provide information back to the provider so that they can determine the patient's responsibility. Um, the Department of Justice has made has announced that they do, in fact, intend to appeal these decisions. That was referenced both in the October 6th FAQs that were published, as well as news reports um, of their intention to appeal this decision. Um, and the agencies, have, the departments have no intention of issuing any guidance on this issue beyond what was included in the October 6th FAQs. What that, those FAQs um, direct payers to make a good faith, reasonable interpretation of the statutory language uh, that remain in effect after the TMA3 decision. So good luck, plans, do your best job, uh, because we're not going to provide you any additional guidance. Just use the statutory language uh, for calculation of the QPAs. And obviously, at this point in time, because TMA3 remains in effect, uh, those four specific um, points uh, cannot be included in the calculation of the QPA. Um, but they also add um, that they intend to exercise their enforcement discretion to permit plans to continue to rely on the July 21 interim final rule to calculate QPAs for services furnished before May 1st of night next year. So effectively, even though the court has held the statute does not permit you to consider these factors in calculating the QPA, the departments have said, but we're not going to bring any enforcement action against you if you continue to consider the factors that were listed in the July 2021 
interim final rule, at least through May of next year. And we may, in fact, the department said, choose to exercise our enforcement discretion further um, and allow the continued use of these rules through November of next year. But we won't go beyond November of next year because we'll give you a full year um, to adapt your processes, uh, payers, uh, to calculate the QPA, apparently assuming that there's going to be an appeal um, and that there may be, in fact, further guidance, you know, further changes to these rules. And we want to, again, not inconvenience the payers by having to recalculate the QPAs. So it's a pretty interesting, I mean, I'll say it out loud, in run around what the district court in Texas was attempting to do by squaring the regulatory language with the statutory language. Because yes, the directive in the FAQ to the payers is follow what the district court did, apply the statutory language, but then they also turn around and say, but we're not going to have any adverse enforcement action against you if you continue to consider the 2021 rules. So that's where things stand um, on the QPA today. Um, also, the other let's uh, the other impact of TMA three concerned when we count certain days starting the initial payment and notice of denial. So remember. The, the provider files the claim for the out-of-network service. The payer then has to adjudicate that claim. And as part of that, include the QPA, but also inform the payer, the provider, excuse me, whether they intend to pay a certain amount or simply deny the claim totally. And it's that action, um, how long does the payer have to make that determination? The statute's claim, the statute says no later than 30 calendar days after the bill for such services is transmitted to the provider. So 30 days from the date that it's transmitted electronically from the provider to the payer, um, that's when they have to make that, they have to make a determination. The, per, the payer has to make a determination. The interim final rule, however, the July 21 interim final rule, says that 30-day deadline begins on the date that the planner issuer receives information necessary to adjudicate the claim, i.e. a clean claim is submitted. And TMA3, the court said, no, that clean claim is different from when the information is transmitted from the provider to the payer. Um, and in fact, the appropriate rule um, is to follow um, what the statute says. So again, we have been waiting uh, for adjudication of claims and provision of the QPA uh, from the date that the payer deemed they had a clean claim. And now we've accelerated that up with the decision in TMA3 to you start the 30 day clock from when the claim is transmitted, clean claim or not. So now we have the October 6 FAQs, which tell us um, direct payers that rather than simply denying these claims, out of hand, we expect payers to communicate with the providers during that 30-day period um, and identify information that is missing that is necessary for actual adjudication of the claim. So now they want to accelerate this process um, when we have an out-of-network claim. As soon as the payer receives that, they should be identifying if the claim is incomplete and then communicating with the provider to secure that additional information as necessary. And then the further direction in the FAQ is that if the plan determines that it cannot make a decision on coverage within the 30-day time frame, the shortened 30-day time frame, um, then they should issue a notice of benefit denial um, without it suggesting that the service was determined to be non-covered. Um, and so it may in effect be just moving the dispute down the road. Uh, because remember, the trigger for the process is when the when the payer issues their decision of either no payment or no coverage, as well as the QMP. It's 30 days from that date, 30 business days from that date, that the provider has to initiate the open negotiation period. So we've accelerated that period of time now because of changing this initiation date. 
um, and probably moved into the ocean, open negotiation period the resolution of uh, whether the service is covered or not, as opposed to it just being a benefit to mile. So Marty, yeah, I, I was just going to say for the providers who are listening to the call, whether you represent a hospital or a physician practice, it is so important for you then to make sure that the information that is on file with the payer as to who to contact and how to contact is constantly updated. It is very clear because when we go into some information in a little bit about the payers who are saying that providers did not follow the process, um, you need to make sure that it is very clear who to contact, who is responsible for this, you know, discussion, etc. Um, I don't know if you if you go to the person who signed the contract, which could be the CFO, and can you reach the CFO? Is it someone in managed care? Is that person on vacation? How is this addressed and followed up on? Because you need to be really clear that this is the person to reach out to. Exactly. Good practical advice. Um, so, again, as I said, the trigger to get to the federal IDR process is the completion of the no open negotiation period. That's a prerequisite. And the trigger for the open negotiation period is when the provider receives from the payer its determination with regard to the out-of-network claim. Um, so what we are seeing is a lot of drop stitches in this process and providers effectively foreclosing the opportunity to go through the federal IDR process. So we are learning now that the significant backlog in the federal IDR process, and Kathy will go through in detail where that backlog is now, um, is due to these eligibility determinations. Um, and part of eligibility determinations are tied to state versus federal process, and part are tied to whether the prerequisites for utilization of the federal IDR process have been appropriately followed. And that is primarily around the initiation of the open negotiation period. And then four days after the close of the open negotiation period, the initiation of the federal IDR process. So you have to fail the open negotiation period. You then have four business days to then submit through the portal um, the notice of IDR initiation. Uh, which is then delivered to the departments. So be very attentive to these timeframes um, because you will foreclose your opportunities under the federal process if you miss these timeframes. However, um, the agencies have published um, a, pros a, a form that they want you to use if because of extenuating circumstances you require an extension of any of these deadlines. So if you should come up and realize, oops, we didn't get the open negotiation period started, we were on day seven by the time we initiated the process, do appreciate that there is now a form to be used when you require an extension of any deadlines for extenuating purposes. You'll see in the footnote there um, the link to the Department of Labor website, which is all where all these are housed, um, where you can find those forms. In addition to that form for extension of time due to extenuating circumstances, um, the departments have published several standard forms which they expect to be utilized through this process, the first being the notice of IDR initiation. That notice, the current version of it, is far more detailed than the original version of it because, again, of these eligibility issues, um, the departments determined they want to front load the notice of initiation to include necessary information relevant to the determination of eligibility. Um, so be sure you are utilizing that standardized notice um, or again, you're going to get yourself caught in this loss of, you know, this, this eligibility determination issue, which slows this process down significantly. Um, there is also a standard um, form for notice of offer, uh, notice of agreement of out of network rate between the parties uh, prior to the cider decision being issued. Uh, make sure you're utilizing those documents. Um, again, this the, we, the detail here on the slide as to how the process goes back and forth. Um, just appreciate that a lot of these deadlines are being blown by the ciders uh, because they're not getting these eligibility determinations uh, resolved. Part of that has been relieved by the more 
uh, additional information required as part of the initiation process. Part of that has been relayed because the departments have actually hired staff to assist the ciders in resolving these matters. That's part of the reason the administrative fee went up um, is because of additional staff to front end this with the ciders. Um, so we are seeing some relief there. Um, but uh, still, this process has a ways to go in its maturity. Maybe the proposed rule, which we are promised, or maybe it's been pulled, um, will address some of these issues going forward. Also want to call your attention to the cooling off period. Uh, the initiating party cannot submit a subsequent notice of IDR involving the same party on the same claims, um, but that is a 90 calendar day cooling off period before you can submit the claim again. Um, so if you've had a particular issue with a particular provider, you may have to be navigating on the front end when you drop the claim uh, to afford yourself additional time uh, so that you don't get caught in the IDR process. Uh, just another version of the federal IDR timeline for those of you who are visual, um, just to help you appreciate that this process is not speedy. Um, and this is going to uh, you know, take nearly 200 days uh, for the point at which you first file your claim through which you receive payment of the out of approved out of network rate from the payer. And we have been hearing complaints that even after the IDR's issue opinions favorable to providers, there's been delay on the payer side in actually sub, you know, submitting the payment, the additional payment. Um, there's also been complaints um, about when fees aren't paid appropriately by parties, how that also has derailed the federal IDR process. Um, because effectively it shuts the process down if you don't pay the administrative fee at the top of the process. Um, and so that's adding additional time delay as well. See, there may be some opportunities for Congress to fix some things here. Definitely. Congress? No, never mind. Um, and Marty mentioned earlier that TMA4 um, was essentially, the, the, the opinion was issued in August of this year. Um, and what we saw was this back and forth issue um, related to can I file appeals, can I not, or disputes. Um, so essentially when the, um, the decision was published on August 4th, right before that, we saw that there was an announcement that the, all, all of the uh, federal IDR functions had been suspended temporarily, um, a, almost um, well over a month later. Um, they began taking um, non-batch disputes, so that's going to be single claim, single service disputes that had originally um, been uh, submitted before that August 3rd cutoff date, um, so that if you had already submitted, then they were beginning to review those and process those disputes. Um, then on October 6th, we saw the, um, the departments reopen the federal IDR portal for initiation of new non-batched disputes. Uh, you have a footnote um, on the bottom of the um, slide that really addresses both by statute and by regulation what is meant by batched items and services. Um, unfortunately, I think that when we start looking at statutes saying related to the treatment of a similar condition, versus regulation that says same or similar items or services, um, each must be billed under the same service code or comparable co code under a different procedural code system. I think we are still open for a lot of confusion oh, in terms Kathy, of we, what is batched. Yeah, just to be clear, Kathy, it's the regulation that the district court in Texas vacated. Right, right. And right. so, okay. but I, I think we still have a lot of confusion so we need to have a ruling on this in terms of what is meant by batched. Um, in um, last week, they extended the deadline for the IDR entities to engage in um, the selection process on those claims that had been um, engaged in prior to August 3rd. And then um, we now have, as of November 3rd, the, that is the deadline to initiate the IDR process for those services where the four-day 
open negotiation period ended between August 3rd and November 3rd. So is that confusing or not? Essentially, if you have something where the, um, once they shut down in August, the process, if you had not in, have not initiated the IDR process, you have until November 3rd to do, do so. We don't know what's going to happen with batched claims, and that's where I think we're going to be looking for a rule that is going to address what is meant by batched. I can honestly, and we're about to talk about the CIDR fees, we've had a lot of discussion from predominantly physicians who, who have had claims um, that they tried to appeal sent back because there were multiple, it was a single service, but multiple CPT Hicks Fix codes on the claim. And they were told each one of these needs to be submitted separately. Um, is that true? Uh, as a part of an emergency room service, all of these different things need to be submitted separately. And then for each dispute, you're going to pay a fee. You're not going to file the dispute because it's going to wind up being more than your reimbursement would have been to start with. So we need a lot of clarity on that one. On yeah, that mystery proposed rule, right? That's yeah. okay. Sorry. Well, and I'm going to raise this something in a minute. Um, in the um, the proposed rule that came out um, a month ago, with comments due tomorrow, um, this is really addressing the uh, administrative fee and the amount that the ciders can charge providers to make their determination. Um, the issue that we're looking at is, first of all, when they established the rate, and we're now looking at a rate that, remember, we went from $50 to $350. Well, now they're proposing $150 that would stay in effect until they issue another rule um, that would increase, I assume, that $150. They are um, using data and the number of um, um, denials or um, disputes that were uh, submitted between um, February and July of 2023. Well, are we looking at a lot of individual claims that because I had to separate each line item as a separate claim or am I looking at an overall encounter with a patient? Um, so it, I, think, I think there's even a question in terms of that projected cost of $70 million to maintain the federal IDR process. Um, and recognize again that it is a fee that is paid, that 150 is paid both by the payer and the provider. Also in this proposed rule was the fee ranges that would be paid not for opening the dispute with the IDR, but for the determination to be issued by the IDR entity. And this is going to range depending on whether it's a single determination, whether it's a group of claims that have been batched. Um, and then again, we were, we were looking at increases to these fees on an annual basis. I took a minute while Marty was talking because I just wanted to know how many people have commented on this rule where comments are due tomorrow. Through Last night at 11.59, there have been eight comments submitted. Interesting to note, there is one major payer. Um, there are several state hospital associations. There is, um, well, I'll say it, HFMA. I know there are more comments that are pending. There are several physician groups or specialty societies that have commented. Um, if you're thinking about commenting on this rule, again, you got until I believe it's five o'clock tomorrow, Eastern time, but um, I urge you to go online and look at what others have said. You might want to read that one payers comments. You might want to look at HFMA and some of the state associations. If you're a provider, you might want to start looking at it from a uh, you don't even have to write a formal letter. You'll see that there's one in there that literally they just sat there under the comment and typed their comment. They didn't attach a letter. Uh, take a look at that. Um, you might want to, um, to actually provide your two cents into this process. Eight comments to date. Um, just very briefly, I think we've mentioned this previously. We And again, we've walked through this based on the dispute process. The last is following TMA2, which again went to this question of 
how, what's the deference to be given to the QPA in determining the out-of-network rate? Um, the August 22 decision uh, directed the deciders, um, excuse me, the, the, you know, TMA1 got rid of the presumption of Q, the QPA is the correct out-of-network rate. That then gets you to the August 22 final rule. TMA2 vacated that August 22 rule, that portion of the rule. Um, the agencies have indicated that they are going to appeal TMA2, um, and they have now directed ciders in the absence of any applicable regulation directing you on how to determine out of network rate. You are left to apply the plain language of the statute um, and determine the out of network rate without giving any statutory circumstance any specific weight. Um, so really, it is broad deference to the ciders to make these decisions, meaning the case you as a provider or a payer make to the cider is going to be more compelling. This gives you really the chance to make your case uh, without being limited to specific factors that were in the regulations. Kathy? Yes, looking at a date real quick here um, on, of the report. Um, this is a report that was published um, April 27th, uh, based upon a report that was published April 27th related to the IDR process going for not quite a full year. But looking at the nature of the disputes and how they, the outcomes, there were 334,000, almost 335,000 um, initiated disputes. CMS says, or the agencies say, that this is 14 times greater the number than the number of disputes that were estimated. Again, we might be getting with that batching process in terms of what can be, you know, has to be appealed separately. Um, of those 334, 335,000, 123,000 of those um, uh, were challenged in terms of the appropriateness. So 37% of the initiated disputes were challenged, I'm going to say probably by the payers as opposed to by the providers, but challenged. Um, you can see that if you're going through this challenge process and whether it is appropriate, et cetera, um, you're going to delay the process because you're going to be doing this back and forth as to whether or not it is appropriate. Um, out of the 335,000, and then we have some that were knocked out related to eligibility, actually 107,000 disputes have actually been closed by the ciders. Um, 39,000 or 37% again, were found to be ineligible. And therefore, out of that 106, we got almost 40,000 that were kicked out. So we're looking at about 60,000 claims here that um, were to be determined. Um, 42,000 of those were closed, which is 49%. Um, the initiating party prevailed in 71% of those de um, de payment determinations. And about 25,000 were closed for other reasons. It could be that the two parties came to an agreement and pulled out. But look at the number related to the 71% of the initiating parties prevailed. For those of you who have been hesitant to file a dispute, it looks to me like maybe right now the odds are in your favor. And a lot of these were decided during the period of time when there was deference to the QPA. Right. So, very interesting stuff. Um, as part of the as part of the NSA, uh, Congress directed the agencies to publish an annual report on the impact of the NSA. That first report was published in July. Um, you have a link there if you'd like to look at it. Um, there's not a great deal in the substance here because, they, as I say, it's only a year in, how much can we determine? But they do talk about the framework on how they're going to evaluate going forward the impact the NSA is having on prices, spending, quality, access to care. And they also do an interesting review of state law studies. So states that have adopted some sort of surprise billing law, what's the research showing on the impact of those state laws? And what they have found consistently in, those, in that research is that there's been a decrease in both in-network and out-of-network prices. 
Um, so it is having negative negative pressure on, on provider prices in those states that have adopted surprise billing laws. It will be interesting on that bullet point related to access, if they will then take into consideration uh, you know, air ambulance providers that are shutting, filing bankruptcy. Right. Yeah. Kathy, we're at the top of the hour, so I'm just going to reference our attendees to the slides. That are, these are back to just two interesting topics we thought worth visiting from the August of 22 FAQs, one concerning plans that utilize reference-based pricing and how the NSA applies to those, as well as how, what do you do with plans that do not have any out-of-network coverage. Um, but you can see on the slides there how uh, the departments have advised. So we'll be back in two weeks talking about some other rules. Uh, isn't that a pretty we great hope, We hope, we <laughs> hope, unless they decide not to publish those too. And that's not going to happen because we are, all of the calendar year rules, so home health, fee schedule, outpatient, ESRD, all of them are sitting at OMB, uh, have been there for nearly a month. We anticipate based on prior practice that it'll be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week where we'll start seeing these released. Kathy will take a good look at what's available, choose what's most appropriate to discuss, but it'll be either, most likely we'll talk about ops or the fee schedules, what our best bet is, um, but we will have sign up material available for that soon. Um, again, as always, if you have questions, please insert them in the survey at the end. We'll do our best to get back with you. Um, and again, if the final rule, if the proposed rule is published, we'll get a summary out to you of the key provisions soon. So thanks again for joining us. Thank you. Back to you, Trevor. Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website. If you have any questions or if we can help, please contact us at pyapc.com. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.